Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 2019 movie, The Highwaymen, which is all about the two lawmen who took down Bonnie and Clyde. And joining us today to help us separate fact from fiction is author, historian, and the research consultant on the movie, John Neal Phillips. During his career, John has interviewed a lot of people close to the events that took place, from witnesses all the way to members of the Barrow Gang itself. His book, Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The Ten Fast Years of Ralph Fultz, details the story from the perspective of Ralph Fultz, who was part of the gang. He also interviewed and edited Blanche Barrow's memoir called My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. She was Clyde's sister-in-law and ran with Bonnie and Clyde for an incredibly tense three-month part of their crime spree. So if there's one guy who knows about the true story of Bonnie and Clyde, it's John. Before we bring John on the line, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one. Frank Hamer was in Louisiana just 17 days after he signed on. Number two, unlike what we see in the movie, the Texas governor, Ma Ferguson, never closed down the Texas Rangers. Number three, Frank Hamer and Manny Galt almost caught Bonnie and Clyde by their parents' homes in West Dallas. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode— And by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with John Neal Phillips about the historical accuracy of The Highwaymen. The movie opens by setting up the time and place, so I thought that would be a great place to start too. Uh, That would be at East Ham Prison Farm in Texas in the year 1934. We get some information about East Ham throughout the movie, like hearing that Clyde served there for five years. But the movie doesn't really go into a lot of details. So can you give us some more historical context around East Ham Prison Farm and the role that it played in Bonnie and Clyde's story? You're right. The the movie doesn't go into that a lot. Uh, They only had two hours. And the focus was really on Hamer and Gauld. But um, East End Prison Farm was originally a privately owned farm. And then in the early part of the 20th century, it was leased by the state of Texas to house prisoners. And then eventually Texas bought the property. And it's still a functioning prison farm to this day. One of the old buildings that Clyde Barrow and Raymond Hamilton, Ralph Fultz, all of them, were housed in still stands. They use it as a kind of a catch-all for anything they need to stuff away somewhere, but it still exists. And uh, the look of the place is about the same, too. Uh, Clyde Barra was sent there for, uh, well, uh, he, he was to serve 14 years, uh, seven counts of auto theft and burglary. He got two years each, and originally they were supposed to be... Uh, simultaneous, but then he escaped from the jail where he was being held. And then he was recaptured and he was brought back before the judge and the judge was really mad that he had escaped. So he made it concurrent, which meant he had to serve 14 years. But he he, uh, ultimately served uh, a little under two years there and then was released, mainly because the prisons, as they still are to this day, were just packed jam-packed. There were like four or five inmates to a cell, if they had cells. So uh, Governor Ross Sterling, in an effort to ease the uh, population in these prisons, uh, started releasing nonviolent criminals, uh, which he was at the time. Burglary, auto theft, nonviolent crimes. Although in the joint, he had already killed one man. But that was not known until years later that he had been behind that. So nonviolent criminals, uh, which he was one, uh, were released, uh, a lot of them, to make room (laughs) because they just were running out of room. It was a a real bad situation. So East Ham, uh, where he served, uh, had been there a long time and it had a reputation. It's pretty remote. It's still kind of remote uh, today, uh, even though it's very close to Huntsville. 
it's where uh, real incorrigible prisoners were sent or prisoners who had escaped, which Barrow had escaped. So they sent him there because it was hard to escape from East Ham. Okay, so he escaped from somewhere else and then was sent to East Ham after that. That's right. He he was in the McLennan County Jail and escaped from there while he was awaiting transfer to the state penitentiary. Okay. Now, at the very beginning of the movie, we do see a breakout from the prison farm, but it's it's not Bonnie and Clyde breaking out. We see them waiting in a car, and there's and then three inmates that, that pile in. Was that a breakout that actually happened? Yes. Uh, on January 16th, 1934, Bonnie and Clyde and another guy raided East End Prison Farm. And there were four inmates that were in on the uh, escape. A fifth one just kind of joined in, but really didn't know what was happening. And he, he ran in the wrong direction, and he was captured later that night. But the other four knew to run to the sound of the horn honking, uh, which Bonnie was the one honking the horn. In the movie, it's portrayed that that she gets out of the car just as plain as can be, just standing out there like she owned the place and starts uh, shooting off this weapon. That was Barra that actually did that. Bonnie couldn't walk at that point. They do portray her injury. They have her limping up there with that Thompson submachine gun that was bigger than the actress playing Bonnie. Probably would have been bigger than the real Bonnie as well, but Bonnie could not walk uh, on her own at that time because of uh, severe burns she had uh, sustained. So she was to stay in the car, and when she heard the gunfire, she was to honk the horn because it was real foggy that morning, and uh, everybody knew to run to the sound of the horn honking, except the one guy that just took advantage of the situation, and he didn't know what that honking horn meant. He ran the other way. (laughs) (laughs) And all five uh, convicts escaped, and one guard was killed. The movie almost then flips that around, yeah, because Clyde is in the car, and he honks the horn, and then I think Bonnie actually started shooting after the horn was honked, so it sounds like just kind of flipped it around a little bit. That's right, and and I, I told uh, the screenwriter and the director that I was pretty annoyed by that, that that did not happen, and I explained why it didn't happen. The director toned it down a bit. It was supposed to be even more radical than what you wound up seeing, so uh, he, he tried to tone some of that that down. The way that the movie shows Frank Hamer and Manny Golt getting uh, chosen to lead the hunt for Bonnie and Clyde it happens through a suggestion by Lee Simmons. And according to the movie, the way it sets up here is the Texas Rangers have been disbanded by the governor at the time, Ma Ferguson. So she's kind of reluctant to bring in Hamer and Golt. The impression that I got while I was watching the movie was that they were considered to be legends of their work because of working with the Rangers, but then simultaneously also considered to be relics of a bygone era. But then Ma is under, she's facing a lot of pressure because of this ongoing bloodshed with uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And so she kind of relents and agrees to let Hamer lead the hunt. And then, of course, later Galt is brought in by Hamer. How well did the movie do showing the way that Hamer and Galt were called in to bring down Bonnie and Clyde? The screenwriter, John Fusco, had to deal with uh, certain elements of the story to try and tell a story that was exciting. So he invented a character that is involved in this particular part of it. As far as uh, exactly how uh, Hamer uh, came to be uh, uh, the man who tracked Clyde and Bonnie, that's pretty accurate in the movie. It was Lee Simmons. After that raid at Eastham, th- this is why the movie starts out with the raid on Eastham, because it was that raid that brought the beginning of the end for Bonnie and Clyde. Because Lee Simmons, who was the general manager of the Texas prison system, was uh, rather seriously publicly embarrassed by that raid. And he was angry about it. And one of his guards had been killed. So he vowed that he was uh, he wasn't going to bring in Bonnie and Clyde. He was going to have them killed. And he uh, had no money in his budget. So he had to go to the state to see if they could create a position that they could disguise 
as something other than what it really was, uh, a hired gun to go out and kill Bonnie and Clyde. That, that, uh, Lee Simmons wrote a book called Assignment Huntsville. Are you familiar with that book? No, I'll have to check that one out. It's out of print. It's been long out of print. It's very rare, but uh, it was published by University of Texas in 1957. Lee Simmons, in his own words, in his book, said, I told Frank Hamer to put Clyde and Bonnie on the spot and shoot everyone in sight. Wow. That's his own words in his own book. There was going to be no arrest. Now, there's some hearsay that Simmons approached uh, a couple of other rangers, including a ranger named Tom Hickman, first and was turned down. Hickman in particular, that part of the story I got through somebody else who Hickman spoke with. Uh, I never spoke with Tom Hickman, but Hickman uh, said that he was approached by Lee Simmons and he turned it down. He said, I don't ambush people and I don't shoot women because that's what it was going to be. It was going to be an execution. It wasn't going to be an arrest at all. Simmons uh, finally got on to Hamer. I don't know why he didn't go to him first. He's perfect, you you know. And you're right, uh, Hamer was absolute legend and a little bit, to a lesser extent, Galt. But uh, Hamer in particular, neither one of them were considered outdated. In fact, uh, Hamer uh, is one of the few that started out as a ranger riding the range on horseback and very comfortably made the transition into the fully mechanized 20th century. I mean, he was a Bertillion expert and, and quite a scientist in tracking criminals and solving crimes. Uh, so, uh, no, he was not in any sense of the word considered outdated in his time. Now, the disbanding of the Texas Rangers, that that never happened. And Ma Ferguson never even tried to do such a thing. That was a device that the screenwriter developed to create this conflict going on with the Ma Ferguson character, which never happened. She was under no pressure. Nobody knew that she was had anything to do with Hamer. Uh, This was all very secret. This all came out after the fact, a few months after the fact, and it it didn't matter to her politically. It only would have mattered to her politically if it had failed. It was a big plus on her side, but uh, the screenwriter wanted to create a conflict. There's a conflict uh, that he creates between Galt and Hamer, which never existed. It's a minor one. But uh, th- this notion that Hamer was reluctant to bring Manny Galt on is, is just an invention. But uh, the screenwriter wanted to create a bit of a conflict there. And then he wanted to create a, a large conflict somewhere in the governor's mansion. And so he created that character of that um, state police guy. Uh, I forgot the name of the character, but th- uh, that's a total fabrication. Uh, but it makes a beautiful scene. There is a great scene with uh, Kathy Bates, who plays Ma Ferguson beautifully, I think, in that movie. There's this great scene where uh, she's uh, getting ready to enter a ballroom. Do you remember that scene? Yeah. And she's having this this knockdown, drag out fight with that that head of the new state police, and uh, she's got this really intense. Kathy Bates look on her face, you know, as she's talking. And then she turns and this beautiful smile breaks across her face and she enters the ballroom. That is fabulous. <laughs> That's really fabulous. Yeah, she did a great job. Yeah, it's well shot. It's well written and it's uh, beautifully acted. I mean, gosh, Kathy Bates, man. Hamer was brought on exactly the way they show in the movie. Lee Simmons brought him in. Lee Simmons uh, knew that there was an issue between the Fergusons, her husband and and Ma Ferguson, and Hamer. Uh, Hamer's the one who resigned from the Texas Rangers when Ma Ferguson was elected governor. He resigned. There was no attempt to uh, get rid of the Texas Rangers by Ma Ferguson at all. Simmons knew this, so he, he met with Hamer in Austin, just like they they portray there. And 
Then Simmons went to Ferguson, as they portray there. And Simmons said, uh, I was thinking about Frank Hamer. And without batting an eye, she said, Frank Hamer's okay with me. So then how did Galt get pulled in? Because, yeah, like you mentioned, there was kind of some tension. But we see in the movie, Hamer brings Galt in. He kind of, He's hesitant at first, as you mentioned. But then how did he actually get brought in then? Manny Galt and uh, Frank Hamer had worked together frequently before that. And uh, Galt also had resigned from the Texas Rangers. It is true Galt was a little cash strapped at the time. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure about the heavy drinking. Galt's kind of a shadowy figure, actually. There's not a lot known about uh, that fella. And I think that's the way he wanted it. But the way he was brought in, Hamer, as soon as he got on the trail, he came up here to Dallas, which is where I am, and um, met with uh, the sheriff, uh, Schmoot Schmidt. And Schmidt had already put one of his deputies uh, full time on the trail. And so uh, Schmidt introduced uh, Hamer to uh, Bob Alcorn, the deputy. And the two of them took off immediately to Louisiana. And through several events, they were able to hook up a a deal with some people that were um, uh, helping Bonnie and Clyde over in Louisiana, but they knew immediately to go to Louisiana because of Henry Methan. As it became clearer to Bob Alcorn and Frank Hamer that this ambush was going to get set up, they decided they needed more firepower. And so uh, Alcorn asked for Ted Hinton out of the Dallas uh, Sheriff's Department. And Hamer asked for Manny Galt. And Manny Galt, on April 14th, 1934, uh, met Hamer in Dallas. So uh, that, that's the way that transpired. And then, then the two Louisiana men, Henderson Jordan and, and his deputy, that, that made the six that were in the ambush team. We kind of already talked about uh, Ma Ferguson and and the Texas Rangers kind of being disbanded there, but the movie portrays it as they're not being brought back on. Hamer and Galt aren't being brought back on as Rangers because they've been disbanded. And so instead, they're given this special highway assignment or highwaymen, hence the the title of the movie. But then it also points out that their jurisdiction is only in the state of Texas. I think uh, later in the movie, there's a scene where Hammer and Galt go into Oklahoma and they're told uh, in no uncertain terms by the local law enforcement that they're out of jurisdiction, they need to go back to Texas. And if I remember right from history, I seem to recall that one of the ways Bonnie and Clyde were able to evade the law for so long was by hopping state lines. So uh, police in, in one state would be chasing them, then they'd hop the state lines to the relative safety of a different state. Was the way that the jurisdiction worked for law enforcement in the 30s a factor that allowed Bonnie and Clyde to continue their crimes for as long as they did? Absolutely. And Barrow knew it. Uh, He used the jurisdictional issue to his advantage. It was greater than just the state line. There were jurisdictional issues between municipalities and the county and then county to county. Police in a municipality would have no jurisdiction in the county, and no county officer would have any jurisdiction in uh, certain municipalities. And another thing, you know, this being the Depression, these uh, municipalities and counties were out of money. They had few resources, so they had very few deputy sheriffs, very few police, (laughs) and and, uh, no communication other than the telephone, and then this jurisdictional thing. And Barrow knew all of that, and he used it to his advantage. There's a story, one of the first murders attributed uh, to Barrow was um, this man down in Temple, Texas, murdered on Christmas Day, trying to keep Clyde and W.D. Jones from stealing his car on Christmas Day. Imagine that, the audacity of somebody trying to prevent you from stealing their car. Anyway, they, so they shot him and killed him. Uh, on the way out of town, Barrow had Jones climb up telephone pole and cut the wires. He had all these tools and, and the like, and he, and he frequently cut telephone lines. And then as soon as you're across a county line, 
pretty safe, uh, but it, it was better to be across the state line. That's why I hung around in places like uh, uh, far northeastern Oklahoma and uh, Joplin, Missouri. Joplin, Missouri is a perfect place. Number one, it was corrupt as hell at the time. And uh, number two, it was very close to three or four state lines, you know. Something else that we see in the movie is uh, when we see Hamer and Galt visiting the Parker and Barrow family homes in the West Dallas Viaduct. According to the way the movie shows it, they have, I think there's a mention of a huge dragnet of some like thousand men. But then Bonnie and Clyde are still able to slip in and out of their homes unnoticed. And we don't really see how they're able to do it in the movie. But at one point, uh, Hamer and Galt notice a bunny that they knew that Bonnie and Clyde had, and it was delivered to Bonnie's mother at her home. Is it true that they were able to evade so many people who were watching? They knew where their families lived, and there seemed like the, the law was watching them, but the way the movie portrayed it, it looks like they're able to pretty much get in and out whenever they want to. That was pretty much the case. It had to do mainly with West Dallas was not part of Dallas. It was part of the county. The jurisdiction was the county. That didn't prevent Dallas police from going over there and picking people up uh, occasionally, but mostly it was Dallas County area. They didn't have the manpower. Dallas County is a huge territory. It really is. And they didn't have the manpower. And even after they started dedicating Bob Alcorn and then later Ted Hinton to doing nothing but tracking Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde was very good at slipping in and out. And everybody knew how tight he was with his mother and his father to a lesser extent, but his mother and his sister and his brother. There was a period there when they were at their hottest that they visited three, four times a week. They had different techniques for doing that. Marie, the youngest sister, told me a story. She lived there at the filling station. Uh, they had a house in the back. And uh, she would go into uh, town, to Dallas, catch the bus in front of their filling station there. One day she's waiting at the bus stop, and she had a friend with her. They were going to go into town and watch the movies. And Bonnie and Clyde drove up and sat there at the bus stop, never got out of the car. That was the thing. They'd pull up in their car, but they never would get out. And the car would be running, and Clyde would have it in first, and the clutch depressed, ready to take off. They sat there talking to Marie, and eventually Clyde felt comfortable enough to offer Marie and her friend a ride into town. And so they got in the car, and, and I asked Marie, I said, weren't you afraid to ride with him? considering everybody was after him. She said, oh, I was, I was too damn stupid to know how dangerous it was. That was exactly what she said. Anyway, they went into town to what is now, uh, what is Dealey Plaza. It looked different then. That underpass wasn't there, and there were hotels and, and the like there where that plaza is. But they parked right in front of the courthouse and sat there for the longest time just visiting. And uh, the whole darn nation's looking for him, and he's sitting in front of the Dallas County Courthouse. One thing that he counted on was very few people had ever actually seen him that were in law enforcement. And he counted on people not knowing who he was, or at least law enforcement. A few law enforcement knew Bonnie, though. But they would disguise themselves. But it didn't matter. He, he was pretty brazen. That story is a pretty good example of the, uh, how brazen he was and how easily he just moved in and out of town. Wow. Wow. Something else that, that we see in the movie is that it seems like they kind of had a secret code. I think it's uh, red beans and cabbage. They, uh, when the, the lawmen hear that... Bonnie's mom is making red beans and cabbage. That that must mean that Bonnie and Clyde are coming home. Did they have these sort of codes that they would use to communicate? Or it sounds like they could just pull right up whenever they wanted to almost. <laughs> that red beans and cabbage, that comes from a 1934 book called Fugitives. It was written by a, uh, a Dallas uh, news reporter uh, named Jan Fortune. A lot of those stories she plagiarized, just took them straight out of uh, crime magazines. I mean, word for word out of crime magazines. But 
you can't discount all of it. Interspersed in there are actual things that family members confirmed to me actually did take place. A lot of it, they said, they don't know where some of that stuff came from. They're not sure about the red beans and cabbage. Uh, Blanche said she never heard of that, but she was actually in prison when a lot of that was going on. But Marie says she didn't remember any of that either. There is a, a Dallas police wiretap, the transcript from about a month of April 1934, just before they were killed. And, and that's a pretty interesting thing to read. And there's a recurring name that comes up. And I'll be darned, I can't forget, that. I can't remember the name. It, it's the alias that Jesse James used when he was went underground, when he was really hot. That name comes up. Oh, the so-and-sos are coming. And Clyde Barrow's nephew told me that he's not, he wasn't sure, but he thought that might have been a code there uh, because Clyde Barrow is a huge fan of Jesse James. Clyde even went to Jesse James' grave in Missouri. And he read everything he could about Jesse James. And one time when he he and Ralph Fultz were together, they had abducted a police chief from Electra, Texas, and they'd taken his weapon off of him, a, 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 a prized weapon. It was this uh, pearl handle, nickel-plated forty five caliber six-shooter, you know, the old-style six-shooter. And they had that, and... Um, they got to some some place. They already released the police chief, but they still had the weapon. And Clyde started target practice and fanning it like they do in the movies, you know, fanning the trigger. And he said to Ralph, he said, that, that's what Jesse James would do. And Ralph said, I don't think so. I don't think Jesse James would have done that. <laughs> You'd blow your finger off doing something like that. But he was a big fan of Jesse James, and I'll be darned, I can't remember the alias that Jesse James took, but that name pops up in this transcript two or three times, which may have been a code, but I'll tell you, there's a, there are two or three times in that transcript when Cumi, Clyde's mother, is on the phone and she knows that phone is tapped. There are things that she said that a, a man called to tell him a story and said, do you want me to tell you over the phone? Which told me they knew the phones were tapped. She said, yeah, tell me now. And they talked kind of openly about the kids. The kids coming into town, or did the kids get away? You know, and so they weren't trying to hide that too much. Another technique Clyde uh, had was uh, he would put a note in a soda pop bottle and drive by the gas station and throw the bottle out. I think we see some of that happening in the movie, like the, we, we see bottles being thrown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They try all kinds of things. The, 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 the bunny rabbit is based on probably a true account. It appears in that Jan Fortune book, but it's also confirmed by Joe Palmer later that Bonnie had this rabbit that was going to be a gift for her mother. So uh, the screenwriter for the movie worked that in to the script there. But as far as that scene with... Uh, Hamer going into West Dallas. Hamer never went to West Dallas, ever. He didn't have any need to. He knew where Barrow was. He was over in Louisiana. He was setting that up over in Louisiana. It took a while because of various things, Number, not least of which making sure uh, that they actually get this guy because he was pretty vindictive. If he found out people were working to put him on the spot, he was going to come after him. Something we do see in the movie is Bonnie and Clyde are, they seem like rock stars. Like, I, I think there was a, a scene in Coffeyville, Kansas, where we see people just mobbing their car, kind of like you'd see with celebrities today. Uh, there's another scene in a, a rural gas station where the attendant tries to cover up the fact that they stopped there. Uh, there's even another point where I think the movie compares them to Robin Hood. They're stealing from rich banks and giving to the to poor people. What was the contemporary opinion of Bonnie and Clyde during their crime spree? Well, it was mixed. Uh, that term Robin Hood was an actual reference uh, made by Dallas newspapers. The first time Barra comes to prominent attention, a uh, Fort Worth uh, or 
technically Tarrant County deputy sheriff was shot and killed by Clyde Barra here in Dallas County. Uh, they were attempting to arrest somebody else and Barra showed up instead. And there was this huge shootout and Barra got completely away, of course. And uh, the newspapers started wondering, well, who is this Clyde Barra? So they started snooping around and uh, those that would talk would say, well, Clyde gives us money. And so they started referring to him as modern day Robin Hoods. So. But the, the public opinion was mixed. Part of any kind of uh, pop cultural uh, reference to them at the time has to be understood in, in the time that there was no television, no internet. The only entertainment was if you could get to the movies. A lot of people couldn't even afford that. Newspapers were the big thing, the big thing. So a lot of people who were, you know, just eking it out, if they were able to do that, found it easy to kind of live vicariously through these gangsters, these outlaws uh, that were in the newspapers a lot, because it was kind of abstract. I mean, think about it. You're reading about something that you didn't personally experience. You can really get into that, and it's exciting, you know, and so th there was a lot of that. And until you were a victim, <laughs> then it was different. So that went on for a long time, and it was a fact that the average citizen who was really having a hard time in the Depression often blamed their predicament on three things. The crooked banks, all banks were crooked to a great cross-section of people. All politicians were crooked, and they were in cahoots with the banks. And all law enforcement were crooked. And uh, th there was an element of truth and, an, and not an element of truth to all of that. But that was a public perception. And anybody that could make fools out of politicians, police, and banks was just fine with them. So here's Bonnie and Clyde. And Clyde knew this. Clyde was, uh, he could have been an advertising executive. He knew how to market himself. And so, yeah, the, the Robin Hood moniker is pretty accurate, right down to newspapers actually using that term to describe them. But then um, later in their spree, after the bodies started just mounting up, and uh, especially after the Easter Sunday shootings, uh, public opinion turned against them. And a good deal of that was caused by law enforcement. Law enforcement knew, uh, Shmoo Schmidt, the sheriff here in Dallas County, knew that uh, this ambush that was going to happen in Louisiana was, was going to come to pass and knew that they were probably going to have to take Bonnie out with Clyde because she was always so close to him. It was just going to be impossible not to get her, too. If they could get her away, uh, everyone thought that Bonnie could easily be rehabilitated and go straight. But she just wouldn't leave Clyde's side at all. So they figured they're going to have to get him. And they're going to have to get him when he's slightly off guard, which he rarely was. And she was always there. So you can see it in newspaper accounts, especially from press releases from the Sheriff's Department, how they were starting to include Bonnie more and more in the story. A really good example of this has to do with the grapevine shooting, uh, the Easter Sunday shooting of the two highway patrolmen who uh, apparently had stopped because they thought the car was in distress and they were going to offer help, probably. That was one of the highway patrol's jobs to help stranded motorists. And that car had been there all day. And they'd driven by once and saw that car there. And then when they came back that afternoon, they saw that car there. So they probably pulled up there to try and help. Clyde and Henry Methvin kill those two guys. But you won't see it from Tarrant County, from the news reports in Tarrant County, but in Dallas County, the news reports completely omit Henry Methvin from being there. And they have Bonnie shooting one of the officers there, which is portrayed in the movie. And I'm pretty annoyed by that. And I told them that. 
told the director that. I told the screenwriter that. But they still kept it in. The director did tone it down a bit more. But it, that portrayal of her shooting that guy and saying, looky there, Clyde, look at his head bounce, that never happened. And I'll tell you how I know that never happened. That came from a witness who was a farmer nearby named William Schaefer, who, when he was first interviewed by law enforcement, said he was too far away to have seen anything. He heard the shots and that was it. By the time the book I'm Frank Hamer comes out, uh, which is in the early 1960s, this witness has changed his story to the point where he has crawled up close enough to the scene to actually witness all the shooting and comes up with this thing with Bonnie saying, looky there, Clyde, uh, look at his head bounce. There's a couple of things wrong with that. That story never mentions Henry Methvin, who was there. He was the other gunman. And also, there were two other witnesses to the actual shooting, uh, the actual shooting of the officer that Bonnie was charged with shooting there. They were in a car on the road nearby and drove by, and they saw the taller of two men shooting the officer that was laying on the ground. And the taller of two men was Henry Methvin. The shorter was going to be Clyde Barrow. Henry Methvin was almost six feet tall. Barrow was about 5'8". So there's a lot wrong with that story there. Well, anyway, uh, the Dallas County Sheriff's Department completely eliminate Henry Methvin from the scene, whereas the fingerprint expert in Tarrant County identifies a thumbprint of Henry Methvin on one of the whiskey bottles. Dallas County says it was... uh, Bonnie's fingerprint that was on that whiskey bottle. And Tarrant County uh, raises hell with them, and they change that story, but they, they still keep concealing Henry Methvin because, well, Schmidt knew that they were working a deal with Methvin's parents over in Louisiana at that time. And uh, part of the deal was the state of Texas would offer Henry Methvin a full pardon in exchange for putting Bonnie and Clyde on the spot. And Governor Ferguson had already signed uh, an agreement to this. And that agreement was in the sheriff's desk over in Louisiana. And it would have looked pretty bad for Henry Methvin to be charged with a double murder that Miriam Ferguson has given him complete immunity to. Sounds like an episode of Homeland or something. So uh, the the public opinion of Bonnie and Clyde was mixed. Uh, It was mostly it was for them. But there toward the end, you know, for good reason. I mean, these these folks were scary, (laughs) scary people. But uh, just what they were doing on their own was scary enough without having Dallas County Sheriff's Department inventing more stuff because they knew they were going to have to kill Bonnie because she was just never going to be far enough away from Clyde to get him without getting her too. So they started inventing this, this image of her as this, uh, well, uh, Hamer himself in a later interview describes her as a quote, she dog, unquote. That's what he says. There's a scene in the movie where we see Frank Hamer going to actually talk to Clyde's dad, Henry Barrow. And during that conversation, Henry points out that he knows that there's only one way that this is going to end. There's a, a scene in there that particular line that kind of stood out to me. It's uh, Henry says something like, uh, end it now, end it for my family. It seems like the movie kind of changed things around. One, you said that Hamer really had no need to go to West Dallas. He pro- then I'm assuming then he never really talked to Clyde's dad. And I'm assuming based on what you were just saying that I'm sure that their families knew that really there was probably only going to be one way that this was going to end. Would that be a pretty accurate statement? Yeah, it's exactly right. Everybody involved knew the only way it was going to end was with Clyde being killed. And Bonnie wanted to go along with him. Even people that ran in the gang, like Ralph Fultz, he said there was no way in hell that Clyde Barrow was ever going to be rehabilitated. 
and there was sure no way in hell he was going to be taken alive. He had uh, promised his mother that if he got cornered, that he would kill himself. He was not going to go back to prison at all. That hell hole, he called it. Now, the portrayal of Hamer talking to uh, Henry there, that may have actually happened with Ted Hinton, who was one of the six officers. He was a Dallas County deputy sheriff, and he was one of the six officers that eventually killed him over in Louisiana. Hinton, in his book, said he went out and talked to Henry Barra more than once. And, and that, that's, that's likely true. So uh, the screenwriter knew that. But the focus was on uh, Hamer and Galt, so he wanted to turn it into Hamer having that conversation. Okay, so they did talk to his father then, Henry Barrow, but not ne- not necessarily Hamer. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's doubtful they ever talked to the mom, though. She did not have any use for cops at all, which is probably rubbed off on Clyde. Henry was a very, very quiet fellow. No one I ever spoke to could... Re- ever remember him appearing to ever be angry. He was very soft-spoken, very quiet, whereas Cumi was a hell on wheels. She was uh, somebody to contend with. She was a little tiny, tiny lady, but everybody in the immediate vicinity was scared to death of her. She was a holy terror. (laughs) She was really something. Sounds like Clyde took more after his mother than... Yeah, uh, the the youngest sister uh, told me of of all the children, uh, they were divided down the middle in temperament. Half of them were of the temperament where they'd get mad, and then that was it. They never thought about it again. But there was just as many of the kids, they'd get mad and never forget it, and that was Clyde. He never forgot anything and uh, was easily hacked off about things. I remember early on when I was interviewing Ralph Fultz for what eventually became Running with Bonnie and Clyde, I had a photo of Clyde, a pretty well-known photo of him kind of crouching in front of this stolen car, and he's got his uh, fedora hat on. uh, And Ralph looked at that picture and he said, he looks pissed off <laughs> in this picture. That particular look on his face is how he looked when he was hacked off about something. You mentioned uh, Henry Methvin and how it sounded like Hamer knew right away to go to Louisiana, but the way that the movie portrays it, there's almost some detective work that goes on beforehand. Um, and then eventually they do end up finding out that Henry Methvin has family in Louisiana, so that must be where they go. And we see uh, Hamer and Galt both going there uh, together, and I think they actually uh, find the hideout at Henry's dad's place, but nobody is there initially. Um, how did the movie do showing just the way that they tracked Bonnie and Clyde to Louisiana? It sounds like there were definitely some changes there. Yeah. Hamer went straight to Louisiana. He didn't, he didn't fool around. He was in Louisiana seven days after he signed on. According to Hamer, I'm sorry, 17 days after he signed on. The whole driving around and wondering where Clyde's going to be, you know, very little of that ever happened. They went over to Louisiana suspecting that Henry Methvin would be a contact, that his family was there. And knowing how Barrow operated, he would probably come into the area. And then make a circuit again, this huge, you know, multi-thousand mile circuit that he would drive. But he would probably come back to Louisiana. And uh, so they went to Louisiana and they located uh, Henry's parents who were really, really down and out. They were living in a tent in Castor, Louisiana, near the town square in Castor, Louisiana. It was through an intermediary named John Joyner, it was discovered that the Methvins would like to make a deal, that they could put Bonnie and Clyde on the spot if they could get a deal for their son, Henry. But Castor was a problem. 
apparently law enforcement there were corrupt, or at least that's the way Hamer put it. They were corrupt. So they had to figure out a way to get them to a non-corrupt parish there in Louisiana, which is portrayed a bit in the movie. Uh, you'll remember Manny Galt went in to first meet with Henderson Jordan and offered him a bribe, and uh, none of that ever happened. But that was to illustrate the issue of trying to figure out who who's straight and who's not, because it was a real dicey thing. <laughs> it really was. They were able to find an abandoned farmhouse uh, in Bienville Parish, which is where Henderson Jordan was. And uh, this uh, mediator, John Joyner, he arranged for the Methvins to move into this unused farmhouse in Bienville Parish, which put them in Henderson Jordan's jurisdiction. And then Bonnie and Clyde started going there. And that's the house that's portrayed that Hamer and Galt go into. They never did do that. They didn't have to. They, well, even if they had had to, it would have been dicey for them to do that. It would have tipped off Clyde and he'd, he'd have never come back. He'd have never come back. He, he'd have known one way or another if somebody from the outside had been in there. Nevertheless, uh, they, they got the Methvins moved into this place and Bonnie and Clyde started coming there. And then uh, they told Henry that they have this deal. And the deal went like that. They were working with this intermediary, John Joyner, so that the Methvins never had to meet face to face with law enforcement. So John Joyner took this proposal to Henderson Jordan. This is before Hamer even showed up. Took this uh, proposal to Jordan, even though they were living in Castor in the next parish. John Joyner knew Henry, uh, uh, knew Henderson Jordan. And the FBI was involved in this too. There was an agent named Kendall, I think it was his name. Uh, he was at some of the meetings between John Joyner and Henderson Jordan. It was not active beyond that, but was at some of the meetings there. And so John Joyner said the Methans want a pardon for their son. So about this time, Hamer and Bob Alcorn start showing up. And so Hamer and Alcorn and this uh, agent Kendall and Henderson Jordan draw up this paper. Uh, it's a handwritten document that offers Henry full pardon in the state of Texas in exchange for Bonnie and Clyde. And Hamer takes it to Austin and personally meets with uh, Ferguson. And Ferguson signs, signs it. And Hamer takes it back to uh, Louisiana. And Jordan keeps that in his desk. And in the meantime, uh, Bonnie and Clyde are coming and going. And they're having to figure out how to, how to make Clyde stop his car long enough to shoot him. It takes a while. They think maybe they'll go in before they move them into Bienville, Paris. They think they'll go into Castor and just start blazing away in Castor, but they're worried about hitting anybody innocent. You know, I mean, it was in the town square. So that's when they devised this, this idea of moving them into this house, which is much more remote. And there was just this one road in or out, um, north and south. There, and they would have to either come from the south to the north or the north to the south. And more likely than not, he'd come from the north to the south because his circuit went all the way up to Canada and back. So uh, it was quite a process, but it was all in Louisiana. There wasn't any of this, you know, driving up to Coffeeville and all that crap. That never happened. But, but it, it, you know, it, it looks cool in the movie. They're able to use it to create a couple of other scenarios, not least of which is that group of fans that kind of crowd around the car, you know, to indicate, man, a lot of people are on these people's sides. You mentioned the the house and the one road in and out, the movie calls it uh, Wrinkled Road. And the way that the movie portrays the ambush happening is Ivy Methvin, Henry's father, pulls his, his car on, onto the road, uh, parks it, I think, on the wrong side. He jacks up his, his front right bumper, takes off the tire, and then when Bonnie and Clyde's car comes down the road, everything, according to the movie, seems to go to plan. Uh, Deputy Hinton 
positively identifies Clyde in the car from a distance. And then when it gets closer, Clyde stops the car and he asks Ivy if he needs help changing the tire. Then we see Frank Hamer step out and to stick him up, he raises his rifle. And there's a moment of pause. We see a look of terror on Bonnie and Clyde's faces through the uh, windshield on the car. And then all the other lawmen stand up, clear that they're outnumbered. Regardless, Bonnie and Clyde reach for their guns and the lawmen open fire. They pretty much unload everything that they have and, and Bonnie and Clyde are killed. How well did the movie do showing the actual ambush happening? Yeah, that's pretty solid. All except Hamer and Galt stepping into the road. They never did that. But all the rest of it is pretty darn solid. I was pretty amazed. Uh, th- there's a couple of minor details that were left out. It didn't matter. Uh, they really nail that scene, uh, the look of it and the like. The, the only thing that never happened was Hamer stepping out and saying, stick them up law. They never said a damn thing. They just shot them. I interviewed three people who were close enough to hear the shots. Uh, Two were working in a field and one was driving a logging truck that had just come around the corner. And all three of them described two distinct shots and then what sounded like dynamite going off with all the other weapons. The two shots apparently were Prentice Oakley. Uh, Even Hinton mentions this in his book. Oakley had died before I started researching this, but uh, I interviewed a close friend of his. And this friend of his said a couple of things about that. But one, he mentioned that Prentice Oakley was so nervous and so wired up that he jumped up before anybody gave an order and he squeezed off two shots. And Hinton in his book said he saw Clyde's head snap back. And that's when the car start going going off down the road. Uh, Barra probably had it in first gear and had the clutch to press. And when he was hit, he let the clutch go and the car's taken off. Hamer describes Bonnie screaming. And then the, all of them unloading on the car. No one else mentions the screaming. Well, the only other one to write about it is Hinton. He didn't mention the screaming. Uh, Hamer mentions Bonnie screaming like a panther, he said. But neither one of them went for their guns. The guns were in the back seat. Uh, I think Bonnie had a a pistol on her lap or a peach or a sandwich, depending on who, which source you you read. The peach and the sandwich were uh, people that came up to the road after the ambush to see what they, including these two farmers uh, that I was, I interviewed. Anyway, um, yeah, Hamer and Galt never stepped in that road. Nobody identified themselves. Nobody said anything. They just opened fire on the car there. But all the rest of us, I mean, it's just dead on. And I remember when they were shooting that scene, they invited me to come over to see that because I wanted to see how they did the car, how they were going to make that car look like it was getting hit. It's pretty interesting how they did that. But I remember between a couple of takes, Woody Harrelson just kind of commented to nobody in particular. He was just standing there in the road while they were getting ready to reset the cameras. And he said, you know, when that car starts coming up that road, that's kind of exciting, he said. <laughs> you know? And it really was, you yeah. At the very end of the movie, there's some text on there, and it explains that 20,000 people attended Bonnie Parker's funeral, and some 15,000 went to Clyde Barrow's. And then it says that the Texas Rangers were reconstituted in 1935 after Ma Ferguson left office and uh, Manny Galt went on to work as a Texas Ranger until his death in 1947 and Frank Hamer went into retirement until his passing in 1955. How well did the movie do wrapping up the story? Well, of course, the Texas Rangers never were disbanded (laughs) to begin with, so i tell you what did happen, and, and this happened after Ferguson left office. The legislature combined the Texas Rangers with the Highway Patrol into a, a one large group called the Texas Department of Public Safety. And so the, the Texas Rangers still exist. And, uh, of course, the Highway Patrol still exists. Manny Gall, I really don't know what he did. He's such a shadowy figure. The screenwriter, John Fusco, did a lot of research on that guy. He found out a hell of a lot more than I ever found out about him. 
but Hamer, uh, he still worked in a variety of uh, security positions. One of the greatest, so you, you got time for me to tell you this story? Yeah, yeah. Are you familiar at all with uh, Lyndon Johnson when he ran for the Senate and the famous 87 votes from Alice, Texas that suddenly materialized? No, not that part of it. I'm more familiar, obviously, with him and you know being president. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, of course, uh, Johnson in 1948 ran for uh, the U.S. Senate against a really popular former governor named Coke Stevenson. So Johnson's campaign manager, who was John Connolly, who later became governor of Texas, he pulled out all the stops and he was cramming vote boxes and doing all kinds of things to try and get Johnson to win. And he won by 87 votes, but Coke Stevenson didn't buy it. Uh, He had heard there's some skullduggery in this little town called Alice, where there's all of these voters' names all signed in the same ink, in the same handwriting. He had heard this. And so he hired some lawyers to go down there and look at it. And the lawyers went down and they couldn't, they weren't allowed to see vote box 13. That's that's the vote box, vote, voting box 13 had these names in it. So Coke Stevenson asked Frank Hamer to go down there with him. And Frank Hamer was Let's see, he would have been 65, 64, 5 then, and uh, uh, was pretty much retired by then, but he was friends of Coke Stevenson, so he decided to go down there. And, and so this lawyer is telling the story. This lawyer and another lawyer and Frank Hamer go down to Alice, Texas. So actually, the lawyers were there already, and Hamer shows up at their hotel. And the lawyer had heard of Frank Hamer, but he was kind of appalled at this old man that came walking through the door there. He's wondering, what on earth is he going to be able to do here? And uh, immediately, Hamer just took command, and he turned into Frank Hamer, you know. And he said, okay, we're going to walk down to the bank where this box 13 is kept, and we're going to take a look at that box. And uh, they said, okay. And said, okay, I want you guys to get up and take your jackets off. And I'm going to take mine off. And they said, why do you want us to do that? And he said, because I want everyone down there to see you're not armed and that I am armed. Because there were these uh, pistol arrows just kind of encircling this bank building to try and keep people out. And so it's like a scene out of High Noon or something, the way it's described. These two lawyers and Frank Hamer heading toward that bank down the middle of the street. And this lawyer is telling stories, not really sure what the heck is going to happen here, because Hamer is armed to the teeth and he's walking like he's not stopping. And they're kind of behind him, you know. (laughs) Sort of like in No Country for Old Men. What about your gun? I'm hiding behind you. They get close to the bank and Hamer raises his hand and with his finger, he just flicks his finger like that to indicate everybody get the hell out of the way. And the seas parted every because everybody was saying Frank Hamer's in town, Frank Hamer's in town, Frank Hamer's in town. And sure enough, they parted and they went in and they looked at that box 13 And uh, sure enough, there were all these signatures and the like. So uh, they went back to Austin to report. And in the meantime, Box 13 disappeared, totally disappeared. (laughs) But that is a great story. I mean, it's just like out of a Western. Hamer kept taking jobs up until he died in 1955. Yeah. You had the chance to actually interview some of the real gang members, like you mentioned earlier, uh, Ralph Fultz and as well as Blanche Barrow. What was that like? And did they seem remorseful for what they'd done at all? Uh, Ralph sure was. Part of the reason why Ralph wanted to do a book at all was to try and make some kind of amends. Part of his uh, idea was to alert people to the fact that this can keep happening if we don't do something about it. That's why we really get into the Texas prison system a lot, because um, more than one person in law enforcement and people in the prison system stated flatly, if he'd been treated better, Barrow, if he hadn't been mistreated in prison, we wouldn't be talking about him today. 
And same with Joe Palmer, too, who also ran with, with Barrow. So Ralph was very remorseful. I remember one time, well, there's two incidents. One, I was over at his house, and uh, his son was there. And at one point while we're talking, his son asked, uh, well, Dad, what, what was the most spectacular thing you and Clyde ever did? And this look came over Ralph's face, and he turned to his son. And he said, there wasn't anything spectacular about any of it. This wasn't fun at all. It wasn't fun for me. It wasn't fun for Bonnie and Clyde. And it sure wasn't fun for our victims, none of them. And then this other time, uh, Ralph and I went to visit a man who had once been a hostage of him and Raymond Hamilton after a big gunfight in Collin County. And uh, it was like a, a couple of old high school buddies getting together again. It was really interesting <laughs> to watch these two guys. Uh, one of whom had been an outlaw who held a gun on this other guy. And they were, they were talking like they were old school buddies or something. But at one point, uh, the way they had uh, encountered this fellow, Raymond Hamilton and Ralph Fultz had been set up to be ambushed, just like Bonnie and Clyde had been ambushed. But they happened to drive right through the ambush and were not even wounded. Ralph had a slight crease on his forehead, and that was it. And Ray Raymond had a crease on his forehead. But it, right after that, their car was all shot to pieces and it was falling apart. So they carjacked this guy that was on the road and they made him come with them. And then they abandoned his car and took another car. Uh, well, that fella, when we went to visit him, that fella said, yeah, you know, it uh, got below freezing that night. And my car froze up and the engine block cracked. And so that car was ruined. And this look came over Ralph's face like, oh, God, I did that. You know, I mean, it's one thing to even have a car during the Depression, if you could afford the tires and the gas and the oil and could drive it. And then to have it have some jackass run you off the road and to where you leave your car there and it freezes up and uh, ruins the car, you know, and that look came over his face. Yeah, he was very remorseful. I couldn't tell if Blanche was remorseful or not. <laughs> Did you ever see the uh, Warren Beatty movie, Bonnie and Clyde? Yes, I, I have. Yeah. You know what she told me about that movie? She said, that movie made me look like a screaming horse's ass. <laughs> that was Blanche, girl. Blanche made it really clear that she was with Clyde Barrow because she wanted to be with him. And I asked her at one point when she and Buck were wounded really bad in Iowa and Bonnie and Clyde, they were wounded too, but uh, they got separated and Bonnie and Clyde and W.D. Jones escaped, but Blanche and, and Buck got caught. And I, I asked her, uh, do you think Clyde felt bad about leaving his brother behind there? And she said, well, I hope he didn't. And then she put it this way, well, we were all young and really stupid, and, and I don't make any excuse there for that, but we were all there because we wanted to be there, she said. You know, so I, I really couldn't tell if she had any remorse for it other than the way it kind of dominated all the rest of her life. Those three months she was with them just defined the rest of her life. Yeah, I was real curious about that because they were so young at the time. And then just, yeah, it's going to dominate the rest of their lives. How much remorse they would feel, you know, once they once a lot of it started to sink in. I imagine, you know, after, after it was over, after Bonnie and Clyde were killed, a lot of that would start to sink in just exactly, you know, how much, what they had done. Yeah, sink in the hard way. Marie, the younger sister, back to the earlier question about the effect on the families that Bonnie and Clyde had, it was a tremendous effect. And the way that Marie put it was, those two boys, and she's talking about Clyde and Buck, uh, those two boys made my poor mama whiteheaded, she said. Mostly she was, you know, pro Clyde and Buck. But when it came to her mama, she was, you know, if it affected her, her mama and it did, she was very angry with them about that. It's a complex thing. It really is, like anything involving humans. Well, since you were also involved in the making of the movie, what's one of your favorite stories from that process? Woody Harrelson is a complete insane freak. He was everywhere. Uh, it's like there were three of them. He had this bicycle 
And he had this this backgammon game going with some of the crew. And so here he is dressed as Manny Galt, and he's got this backgammon game under his arm and riding off on a bicycle between takes to play backgammon with, with friends. But he, he was hilarious, that guy was. And I couldn't believe it. He had this uh, friendly sort of battle going on with one of the camera operators. Apparently, this camera operator had scolded Woody Harrelson for getting in, in the sun for a shot when all the other shots were, uh, they had this uh, awning set up to diffuse the light. And in one of the shots, Woody got just a little bit in the sun. After that, every single take, when the uh, first assistant director is getting ready to say roll action, uh, Woody Harrelson's singing, Here Comes the Sun. Here comes the sun, da 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 here comes the sun, da 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 And then, then uh, you hear the first assistant director say, action, and all of a sudden he's Manny Galt. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> here comes the sun. Yeah, really. Yeah, really. All of a sudden he's Manny. I don't know, you know, he's, he's really good. He was really good. Uh, but uh, really my favorite thing was uh, the uh, special effects guys that rigged the car to look like it was getting shot up. They were so nice. In fact, everybody in the crew was really nice. They, they knew that uh, my background was in art, but I have a degree in filmmaking. And I, I teach a film class at the college where I teach. And they knew that. And so they were showing me everything. And the special effects guys showed me, and they let me photograph it. They let me video it for my class. Every single little thing that they did, they had these fantastic devices that they they had built themselves to make that car look like it was getting shot to pieces. And, and uh, they took the historic photos of the real car, and they had three cars that they used. And the one that gets all shot up, by hand, they took a hammer and a punch, and they punched every hole in that car based on the photo of where the hole was supposed to be and whether it was an entry wound, uh, entry hole or an exit hole out the other side. Then they put these little blasting cap charges inside that hole and then they bonded the thing up and repainted it. Even in person, you could hardly see the little dimple there. And then they had all that wired to this motherboard and remotely they could make any one of those go off anytime they wanted. And then for the glass... <laughs> The glass, they had these little half-inch pieces of copper tube. And uh, you, you know these glue guns? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, electric glue guns. They had the glue sticks, and they cut little pieces of those glue sticks and stuck them in those half-inch holes. And they had a little charge at the end that was hooked up to the motherboard. And they would fire those little pieces of glue through the glass. And it really looks like, if you see the movie again, you'll see all the glass is flying out because the little glue uh, stick pieces are making the uh, glass fly out. But it doesn't matter. It works. It worked really great. Uh, I remember uh, running into uh, the special effects uh, supervisor uh, on one of the scouting, uh, location scouting. Uh, then I found out he was in special effects. And I said, how are you going to do the car? And he said, oh, you've got to see this. Uh, and he started explaining it to me. And I said, oh, yeah, I've got to see this. So they invited me to uh, come out to film and of that. that. That was interesting. That and Woody Harrelson being such an insane freak. He, he's a lot of fun, that guy is. Yeah, well, I mean, at the very end of the movie, they do show actual photos of it. And I mean, I didn't look at the two side by side, but man, the, like the, the holes and everything, you know, in the movie as well. And then seeing the real ones, it looks really, really close. Yeah, they're very close. Yeah, they, they, they work really hard on that. And then the bit where the car takes off down the road, that's the second car. And that one already has all the holes in it. So they shoot the ambush scene uh, where the car blows up and everything. And then they bring the second car out. And that car has no engine. So it had to be towed there. But they had this great rig. They had a hook on the end. Uh, underside of the car hooked to a steel cable 
that was thread through a bunch of pulleys that ran for about a quarter of a mile down the road, then crossed the road so the camera won't pick it up, and then through a bunch of more pulleys, and then it was hooked up to a golf cart. And so when the car starts to move, it's actually the golf cart pulling it. And there's a young fella underneath the hood who's actually, there's a little tiny steering wheel and he's actually steering the thing because Bonnie and Clyde are dead. They can't, they can't see where they're going. And he steers it very deliberately right into the embankment, just like it really did. And that same guy is operating the smoke machine to make it look like the radiator got hit there. Those special effects are pretty cool. Yeah, those are pretty cool. The two guys that worked together on that, uh, they had worked all their career on that. And their dads had worked together as special effects guys all their careers together. <laughs> so, yeah, it was kind of cool. Ah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Let, let's say that you were in charge of, of directing the movie. Is there anything that you really wish they had included that didn't make it into the film? Not really. I thought the screenwriter and the director uh, did a, a great job. Uh, I mean, it's a great movie. It's not strictly historically accurate, but it's pretty darn historically accurate. The uh, production designer worked really hard to make sure everything, right down to the way badges were supposed to look. I was furnishing all these photographs. They, they were all, they peppering me with questions. What does this look like? How, how, how did cars park on the street in Dallas in 1930? You know, stuff like that. What was in Schmoot Schmidt's office hanging on the wall? You know, things like that. What kind of clothes did Miriam Ferguson wear? That kind of thing. So the, the look of the of the thing and the sound of it and everything is really great. I, I thought, I thought it was a great movie. I never watch movies thinking I'm going to learn a lot about history. I go to historians for history. And for that reason, I love the Beatty movie, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. I think it's a fabulous movie, man. There's nothing about that that's accurate, but it's a great movie. It really is a great movie. But uh, I tell you of all the movies I've seen, this one, The Highwayman's the closest to really capturing the time and uh, the feel and the look uh, of the thing. It, it, that's another thing. The cinematographer in that movie, he's a big deal. When I first met him, I was kind of uh, awed because he's such a big deal. Uh, he uh, shot Sea Biscuit and um, Pearl Harbor and uh, Jurassic World and uh, all these things. And when I first met him, I, I said, you shot one of my favorite movies. And he said, yeah, what's that? And I said, Benny and June, which is an old Johnny Depp movie. The first assistant director heard that and he said, you know, that was on the other night. That's a pretty good little movie. And, and the cinematographer said, yeah, that's a pretty good movie. And then they started joking. Have you ever seen that movie? I haven't. No, but I'm going to have to go watch it now. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Johnny Depp character, he... Uh, makes grilled cheese sandwiches with a, an iron. And uh, uh, so the first assistant director said, uh, that's a really good movie, except I don't know if you can make a grilled cheese sandwich that way. And the cinematographer, his name is John Schwartzman, he said, oh, yeah, you can. I tried it. <laughs> and it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to try that, too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that guy, the cinematographer, he, he knew I, I taught this class and he told me all kinds of things that they do to those digital cameras to make the digital image look closer to film because film has a, a, a livelier look to it. To, it's just different. They actually destroy, uh, partially destroy the digital camera to make it have that kind of film look to it. And so that was real interesting, too. But as far as directing it, I, I wouldn't do anything different. Uh, John Lee Hancock did pretty dang good, I thought. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to chat about The Highwaymen. You've got a great book called uh, Running with Bonnie and Clyde. And then, of course, also you edited Blanche Barrow's memoir called My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. So let's say someone's listening to this and they want to learn more about the real story. Can you give an overview of your books and where someone can pick up a copy? Yeah, Running with Bonnie and Clyde is the full story from before Bonnie and Clyde to after Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, then My Life with Bonnie and Clyde, which is Blanche's memoir, covers that very intense three-month period that she was with them there 
They're both published by University of Oklahoma Press, and you can go to their website, OUPress.com, and order straight from there, or you can order it from Amazon or uh, any place that sells excellent books. (laughs) Thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank John Neal Phillips once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 2019's The Highwaymen. If you want to learn even more about the real Bonnie and Clyde, go check out John's excellent books, Running with Bonnie and Clyde, The Fast 10 Years of Ralph Fultz, and My Life with Bonnie and Clyde. As always, you can find links to those books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Frank Hamer was in Louisiana just 17 days after he signed on. Number two, unlike what we see in the movie, the Texas governor, Ma Ferguson, never closed down the Texas Rangers. Number three, Frank Hamer and Manny Galt almost caught Bonnie and Clyde by their parents' homes in West Dallas. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's let's start with number one. Frank Hamer was in Louisiana just 17 days after he signed on. That is true. As we learned from John, almost immediately after signing on, Frank went to Louisiana to set up what would become the ambush of Bonnie and Clyde. There wasn't nearly as much of the driving around different states like we see in the movie. That brings us to number two. Unlike what we see in the movie, the Texas Governor Ma Ferguson never closed down the Texas Rangers. That is also true. And by being true, what I mean is that the Texas Rangers were never disbanded or shut down like the movie implies. That means number three is the lie. Frank Hamer and Manny Galt almost called Bonnie and Clyde by their parents' homes in West Dallas. John told us that Hamer never even went to West Dallas. He pretty much went straight to Louisiana, as I mentioned just moments ago. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. My hope in sharing this information is to go beyond just my podcast, but hopefully you'll start to appreciate all of the podcasts out there, the great podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more, because none of them are free to create. Of course, I only have these stats for my show. So with that said, today's episode's took a total of 28 hours to create and cost $15.98 in out-of-pocket expenses. As I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 28 hours obviously does not include the years of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not a part of the production of this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, uh, manage social media, create the email newsletter, and all those other little things outside of creating this one episode that are still required to make the overall podcast. Similarly, on the expenses side, that $15.98 is just for things specifically for this one episode. It does not include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond producing this one episode. For example, the cost of the microphone I'm talking into right now, the audio interface it's plugged into, the computer, the software, all the podcast and website hosting costs, and on and on, and they all add up and can cost quite a great deal of money each month. All those things take time to set up and maintain, and they cost money that go beyond the things that are associated with this one episode, but they are all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for these sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. As a bonus, you'll get access to the producer's feed, which as of this recording has over 65 exclusive minisodes that you can only find there, as well as ad free versions of the regular episodes like this one. You can find out how to get access to all of that by supporting the show over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. 
Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.